Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Um, I, my name is Casey Carroll. I'm an instructional designer with the Center for Teaching Excellence. I will be our uh, host and moderator for today's session. So I will go ahead and turn it over to today's presenter. Uh, Alyssa Leggett is the director of the Office of Academic Integrity and Student Contact. Um, I think so. I, <laughs> I missed your title. Yeah, I was right. The executive director. Um, and our today's session, as part of the Fostering Practice Learning Community Certificate of Completion, is promoting academic integrity in the classroom. So I will go ahead and turn it over to you while I pull up our slides. Thank you so much. Um, I am really grateful that you are interested in being here. So um, my name is Lisa, and I have been teaching since 1998, and I love it, and I love talking about teaching and learning. And so this is a very brief um, kind of encapsulation of what our learning outcomes are. But we want to talk about trends because those are constantly changing. So there were even some changes that um, I made to this yesterday because those are um, ever evolving based on student culture. Understanding why students may cheat. So we're going to talk about that. And we also have a consumerism presentation that we do with CTE and a lot of those things tie together. So if you find yourself enjoying the, wait a minute, why does this happen at all? It isn't because we teach a bunch of bad people. It is a matter of incentives and ease. And so people do things they wouldn't normally do and identifying successful tools um, to address academic misconduct and recognizing how important faculty are in um, kind of dissuading some of the ways that students are tempted to cheat. So Don McCabe is one of the leading researchers on academic integrity. And one of the things that he talks about is the fact that it is not implicit to students that this is an organizational and a personal value. And it is at the cornerstone of why institutions exist and how we function. And so saying that ends up being pretty critical so affirming that it's a core institutional value and then, you know, so students aren't just like, you know what, I knew how to do this before in high school, nobody cared. I have a higher workload. I have a little more pressure. I may fall back into some habits that were not positive to begin with, but that didn't seem as critical because, again, when we look at some of the consumerism components of high school and um, even educational bills leave no child behind. Even those things kind of encourage a score and a certain metric instead of learning as the core of why we do what we do. Um, it makes sense that so many things that, that surround us lead us to think, oh, you know what, students probably know this and students are thinking the exact opposite. So I like this as kind of a bit of a framework. So this research hasn't changed that much or we would not be putting 2017 research up there. 2017 research, um, that was pretty close for about 20 to 25 years before that. So self-reported cheating behaviors, they did, so McCabe is the key researcher in this, um, and Lang, and they looked at various public schools. They actually used USC in one of these to say, self-report anonymously if you have done one of these behaviors, 47%. And some of the questions were in the last year, some of the questions were in the last, um, in your college career. So um, some of these are smaller, some are bigger, but it's important to know that this is a widespread issue and some of it is completely avoidable. So also freshmen and students with higher workloads and high achievers are more likely to be the ones that are, and people struggling are more likely to cheat. So again, it goes back to not whether the, it's a good or bad person, it goes back to the temptation. What are the, the things that you may be able to control? So freshmen who may be less skillful, um, and we talked about that in um, the last session last week, how do we help them be more skillful in the classroom and how do we even create our Blackboard module so it makes sense? How do we say at the beginning where we're going at the end so that they understand the relevance of what we're doing? Students with higher workloads, may have a time management constraint that we can't help unless we are explaining on the first day. Here are the assignments. 
here's, I think that this main assignment, this at your midterm, is going to take about five hours of research, three hours of kind of outlining and pulling that research together, and the final product is probably two hours. Telling students what you anticipated taking so that they don't think it's five hours total, get to the fifth hour, have that oh crap moment, and then do something that they wouldn't normally have done without that constraint. High achievers, typically from the pressure is what we assume. And then those that are struggling who feel like I've got to get a C in this class. Much of this makes sense just the way the human brain works. And if students just feel like they are getting that grade and there is no relationship with their faculty member, there is no relationship with the material, it isn't likely to change. Faculty have a huge role in preventing cheating behaviors. Um, and we're going to talk about that next, but it is gigantic. So how you organize your class how you, um, what your assignments are and how meaningful they are, whether or not you talk to students about where their interest lies. So there are a lot of ways to do that. And I'm getting ahead of myself because this is so much fun. I just get a little too excited. Um, but when we look at the faculty role also, please keep in mind that you talking about um, the importance of it and what your response will be. Um, what we have found in um, behavioral change and motivating behavioral change, whether it's related to alcohol and drugs, whether it's related to readiness for change theories, whether it's related to this, the likelihood that a student will get caught is the main deterrent, the main reason students will change a behavior. If they feel like they just turn it in, you're not paying attention, you're just putting a check on it and sending it back, you're not deterring it in ways that if you're making single you know, comments on it or you're saying, I want you to do some of this in class so that I know that it's coming straight from your brain onto the paper, they, they can't get caught doing that. So when we look at participating participation in e-cheating, um, rates tripled for academic integrity cases here when um, we all went home for the lockdown. It's the worst year that we have ever had. And so a lot of people um, propose that it was from feeling that disconnection, not feeling like anybody cared, not feeling like anybody was going to read that anyway. Um, there are a lot of things that could have gone into that, but I proffer the similar. If students don't feel like it matters, um, why would they invest their time? And the economics of cheating also says that too. If they can pick up a shift at work and, you know, just say nobody cares anyway. Um, there are a lot of competing interests. This is the e-cheating spectrum, but not all of this is actually cheating. So this is a quick primer on social study sites and kind of what's happening just in case um, you were unaware. I assume that everybody on here was aware, but social study sites are, um, Google could be considered the first social study site. So students go to the web to learn. We know that. We go to the web to learn. So the quickest way to learn something um, efficiently is just to go to the web. So what these sites have done is capitalized on that and said, you buy a subscription from me, and then we're going to provide you all of these study materials, some of them ethically, and some of them I question whether it's ethical at all. But part of that issue is how they get their material. So Quizlet, students can share online flashcards. So a lot of students use Quizlet because it can make their flashcards more quickly. Um, Course Hero, um, students add information. So if they have your test from Bio 101 and you gave it back to them, they can then upload. So some sites even say you have to upload this many in order to be able to access the site to see what other people have uploaded. I mean, it is, it is a process where they are trying to build up their own library so that they have the best site. Chegg um, does a lot of different things. They sell textbooks. They do what they call online tutoring, which means you ask a question to a Chegg tutor because you paid for the subscription. They try to find it and send it back to you remember that for later, um, especially if it's a textbook problem. So if you, 
this is the first of three times I'll probably say this. If you're using textbook problems, they are 100% on all of these sites. So uh, it's a forehead slap. Um, so students, one, aren't learning, and two, if we're giving credit for mastery of that, um, there's the likelihood that there's mastery is um, disturbingly low. Messaging app. So the main problem that we have in academic integrity is GroupMe. And so if it's okay for your class to have a GroupMe if they're asking questions about course content or they're asking about when some things do or whatever it might be. I know, quell your desire to say read the syllabus. Um, but what we have is someone who said, does anybody understand the question number five? What is the answer? One person puts it out. Now everybody has access to that answer. Here's some of the issues with that. If you changed up the order of questions, it's less likely somebody can cheat using GroupMe. If you have the test open only for the amount of time that your course runs, that's less likely to be a problem. We're going to get more into that, but if it's open all day, people can send questions out everywhere. Here's the reality too about GroupMe. We usually have one shining candle of a student who says, this feels bad. This student just sent question five's answer. Now everybody who is in that group me is suspect. We don't know if they use it or not. It is a terrible situation to accuse someone who's like, I never even looked at the group me. We'll never know. Um, so making sure that you're communicating with your students. If we have a group me and there are test answers that are in there, that is a violation of the honor code and we will be sending that. You don't, of the 100 people who are on there, you don't know how many people, don't tell them it's only one. You don't know how many people are going to not want to be culpable, save their own skin, which, yeah, and make sure to turn that in. Slack is kind of similar. We really see problems um, much more with GroupMe. Ghostwriting, we know about all of the paper mills um, and the Chronicle of Education is probably a three-year-old article now, but did an excruciating one on the fact that in Kenya to make a living wage, thousands of PhD level students um, would get jobs with these corporations, with these mills, because they were paying a more, more of a living wage than what they were making um, in jobs in a developing country. So they are writing high quality papers just to get by based on the economics of where they are versus where we are. So it is um, prolific. Attendance apps. So it is also against the honor code for someone to, if you're giving, especially if you're giving um, attendance scores, and that's part of their grade, if somebody signs in for someone else, that's a violation of the code. In the grander thing of cheating and plagiarizing, it's on the smaller scale. But that's still, if they receive a grade for the number of attendance, that's problematic and that's a violation of what they should have been graded on. So that would be an issue too. So these are some recommendations that we have. Um, I think most faculty prefer Top Hat um, and Top Hat has a lot of other functions. And so um, that's an easy way to take attendance if you need that, but people can cheat or use these properly. Some of this may feel like, oh my God, this feels so bad. It, we can be realistic. Knowing where your students are coming from, I think helps us know how to um, interact with them better, know what their needs are, so that if we're meeting those needs, maybe they are just less likely to have those temptations. We can build stronger relationships and um, understand what their motivations are. So they learn best through video. When I asked my capstone scholars, a class of U101ers, -on where they get their news most frequently, it's TikTok. This is the reality. So whether or not we approve is of zero significance. So Snapchat, Instagram, that's how they know what's going on. So let's keep that in mind. I have a TikTok account because I work with college students. So keep that in mind. They expect instant results. So letting students know when you are answering emails, letting students know, especially online classes, um, when they can expect an answer, and knowing that if you're like, it'll be within 48 hours, um, I think we got to try harder. So we've got to be able to say, 
I look at my email between four and five every day. If you email me at 630, it's probably gonna be the next day. Just letting them know what to expect is much easier. And it isn't that they're impatient or entitled. They can order something on Amazon and have it the next day. Imagine what this creates. They take a picture and they post it. We had to take a roll of film to the freaking Walgreens and wait six days. Everything changes the calibration of expectations of time when you've had some of the benefits that they have. And it, like I said, they didn't start that way. That's the reality around them. On their open and social online, so they are comfortable in the online environment, but that doesn't mean they're comfortable with every platform. So if you are giving a Blackboard test to a freshman and they have never taken a Blackboard test before, we want you to do it with them, to try during class time to show them how to use that particular platform. They are probably going to pick it up very quickly, but what we don't want is the added anxiety of them having an issue with it um, and then not knowing where to go. As we said in the last session, if you are giving a Blackboard test between 2 and 3.15, let them know, I'm going to be online between 2 and 3.15 so that if something goes wrong, I'm here to address it immediately. We have increased mental health concerns. This is, um, we haven't even seen studies about all of the impacts of COVID um, on this age group, but certainly the level of depression and anxiety, which is, or have been the two most common presenting issues for counseling centers for 30 years also, but the number is higher. The debilitating nature of it is um, higher. And so things that we can do in the classroom to help students feel comfortable, again, taking an online test or having a low stakes um, quiz, things that aren't 50% of your grade is at the end of the class in this final exam. Um, yeah, and economic concerns. So if people feel like they have to maintain the scholarship and it's 50% of their grade, they may be, again, these are the kind of factors and consumeristic brains that go, oh my gosh, maybe I just need to cheat to make absolutely sure I don't become a burden on my parents. Hyperconnectivity, the decrease in control, um, and an increase in perception. So Dan Early did this um, wonderful TED Talk. Some things he's done aren't wonderful, but called, um, oh, it just left me, our buggy moral code. If people in your class feel like cheating happens and nobody's doing anything about it, they're more likely to do it. If they feel like this is a higher um, standard in here and people don't cheat, they're less likely to. It is that simple. That's how influential we can be. And the focus is on employment. So 90% of USC students want a, career, a job, I'm sorry, a degree to get a better job. Of course, of course, of course. The liberal education, which is where higher education started with religion and liberal education, um, doesn't feel as functional to our students anymore. So challenging the sport. So Sanford's theory um, is one of the most basic and one of the most applicable to all college students. It's applicable to our kids. It's applicable to anyone who's starting something new. So if we just challenge students so much, and we probably have seen this, everybody's in their stasis, we apply environmental challenge. If we apply too much without the support, without making sure that they know that they can come to us with questions, without parsing it into pieces so that we make sure there's mastery here first before we build on, my kids shut down. If they feel like this is too hard, it's too much, I can't get it, add on the anxiety, add on the depression, we're going to have students who just retreat. How we deliver the hardest components. So if we know the final project in our class is rigorous. We want to be very deliberate about this is going to be one of the more complex components. So let's do um, like Mentimeter, asking questions in the beginning. Let's see at the beginning of class how many students are still confident about what was covered in the last class. Asking questions to see where are we on the confidence level to make sure that we're okay to keep on moving letting students know you're deliberately doing that because you don't want them to not be able to build upon the knowledge that you've already done. So you can even show them this. I really, most of the stuff that um, we train on from the Office of Academic Integrity, we're like, show your students this. Challenge, support. If you feel like we're going like this on this continuum, let's talk about it. You're a teacher, you can solve it. So much of the rest of this presentation is on creating the culture. 
We're going to talk about how to establish clear expectations, utilize some prevention strategies and what those are, because all of them are F-R-E-E, -E, and then how do you report the concerning behavior and how do you address it? Okay, there are a few different roles um, about how instructors can approach this. Um, in this article, <laughs> doesn't have a citation. It's in the reference section, but ouch, academic integrity. This is where kind of writers about teaching and learning and academic integrity have found people generally fall somewhere along this. So the far left, which we hope doesn't happen in, I don't think you're in that category because you're here. Um, they don't really teach about academic integrity. It's part of every single class. It's part of their degree. It's students want to please you. So talking about it is important just to say they start to know how to avoid it you would be surprised in our international student population there are different cultural expectations so to assume that um schools as we know high schools and public high schools have various different um funding um structures the likelihood that everybody coming into your classroom has the same understanding it, they don't so the referrer Here's some information. Oh, you know, OSAI's website has all of the um, offenses. Make sure that you read and understand them. They're not going to go back and read and understand it. Heck no. The cooperator, okay, academic integrity is going to come in and talk to us about common um, problems that happen and mistakes students make without even realizing that that could be a violation of the code of conduct. Yay. Thank you. If they don't attach that to what you're doing in the classroom, that's just one more thing. And they're like, well, are, are you going to do anything about it? The ambassador says, we're in this together. If there's, you're one of these people who's like, I would never cheat. I wouldn't be able to look in the mirror the next day. It's not fair if I'm not looking out to make sure that you have an equitable experience in this classroom. If you spent three hours preparing for this and somebody else spent three minutes, that's not equitable. I'm looking out for you. Let's make sure that we do what we can do to make sure that this person who might take three minutes, we remove the temptation to do that. Okay, the TPAC model. This, this isn't necessarily a pedagogical um, recommendation. During COVID, this is the model that um, some researchers looked at when they were reviewing how teaching and learning should be, how it should evolve during COVID because we needed a lot more technical knowledge to teach students in the same way online. I think this is one of the byproducts of COVID. We still need to kind of have this three-part series, this technical pedagogical content knowledge. Um, so we start with the content. So the content is, is this a class in law? Is it a class in you know, social sciences, whatever it is? So you've got the content knowledge solid what are your pedagogical techniques? And I'm probably overusing pedagogy. Pedagogy is more a K through 12 um, concept because it's kind of the delivery of the information. Um, what we want from our college students is interaction um, with that content. And then what's your technical knowledge? So if you're looking at this and I'm like, I don't know a lot about pedagogy and I don't know much about technical knowledge. One of the great things is CTE can teach you on all of these. So I try to test myself on, before I go into the classroom, my weakness is technical knowledge. So what are the things that I can work on to make my class better um, using technology, or at least understanding how I can recommend students use technology. So what we hope for, and again, this is in the prevention phase too, in the setting expectations, you're designing your course with integrity in mind. I know some of you are like, oh, this lady is so pie in the sky. Um, but these steps are simple. That's why it's worth at least um, covering some of this. So draft outcomes that include integrity as the focus of learning. So students are going to demonstrate an ability to incorporate other words and ideas into their own work with integrity. Um, thank you, academic, or I'm sorry, <laughs> artificial intelligence. That has made this even harder. This slide, I can't wait to redo this entire thing because in one calendar year, how we can do this has completely changed. That's why we talk about this issue and that's why it's always evolving. Determining potential threats that may exist when designing assessments, artificial intelligence. If you aren't on top of it, you may be 
stepping right on the big pile of poo because you're not even aware of how easy it is for artificial intelligence to give a student um, a prescriptive answer to what you're looking for. So we've got to outsmart what is um, being generated outside of us. So if you're seeing um, presentations, again, there's ours, there are college ones specifically. We're working with a lot of different folks on campus on how to apply it to specific um, sciences and disciplines. So if you do a little search and our academic integrity website has a page on artificial intelligence just to at least give you, um, again, a bit of a primer on it. So our clear expectations. Revisit your syllabus statement on, <laughs> I think that's the next slide, but on our website, we love it when people um, plagiarize from the academic integrity website. Funny, who knew? Feel free to use our syllabus statements. They've been vetted, we wrote them. So we're happy for you to go, I don't wanna start from scratch. Don't, let us save you some time. You have to talk about the statements you know. Review academic integrity policies. The best part is we have a tutorial on our site. So when we were looking at that um, referrer, collaborator, ambassador, watch that with your students or feel free to make it a homework assignment. There's a quiz after it. And then on the second day of class, what surprised you? So you can process it without, nobody wants to hear you talk, nobody wants to hear me. I say this because I'm projecting. Talk about here are, here's what plagiarism is, here's what complicity is, but do they need to know? Yes, because they come in with different um, backgrounds in that. So let, let us do that heavy lifting, give the quiz, and then talk about what surprised you. Um, talk about your collaboration definition, because every instructor has a different definition of collaboration, and students can run afoul without even realizing they did. Or they can go, oh, there's a little bit of a hole in that. Review and discuss academic challenges early and often. Um, in my goals contract, which we talked about last week at the beginning of class, asking them what do they think is going to be the most difficult academic challenge when they look at the syllabus. What are the steps they're going to take if they realize those challenges? When can they come to you when they have those challenges? Establishing effective assessment ground rules. If you do not want students to use notes from the web, but only notes from class, so that you're incentivizing them to be slightly more engaged in class, you have to say that. Using notes means a lot of different things that you may not even be realizing. Set those guidelines for the social study sites. Yes, you can use them to study, but if you are permitted to bring a cheat sheet in, it can't have anything from social study sites. It can only have um, information from the book. Incorporate in the honor statement prior to assessment. There is, it's crazy, I love it, empirical data to show that if students have to write an honor statement, which I have students write, I have practiced academic integrity and this paper or assessment is 100% my own work. Um, Alisa C. Wiggett, that actually deters. Handwriting it has more efficacy. Go figure, how easy is that? If they have to type it, because it's an online thing, that's okay too. But letting them know before they start a test or when they end it is up to you. Both are valuable. Um, easy, easy, easy. And that reminds them, Academic integrity is part of every course. It's not just something we say at the beginning. So setting guidelines regarding use of social study sites. Um, here, here are some, this is kind of in that recommendation phase. So creating digital flashcards that are not public, being very specific. And again, if you wanna, cut, you wanna use this as what you cover in your class, go for it. But creating digital flashcards that are public um, using my work no mine is a the instructor um using sites to reinforce and expand your knowledge again we're going to have to become it's not tolerant it's not embracing it's somewhere in between of that given um, artificial intelligence so maybe we start with the brainstorming session of what you want your final project to be and this has been done at the wharton school since artificial intelligence started there was a february um npr story last February, where this Wharton instructor was like, I want you to generate 100 ideas 
in AI for what your final project could be. Things that people will never would have thought of. So yes, expand what your imagination could have come up with. But if you upload quiz content or lecture material to social study sites that, and they are mine, um, that is going to be a violation in this class um, of classroom rules. And so that would go to the Office of Academic Integrity. Also, uploading their class writing assignments. Again, one of the hacks to this is if you're always changing your writing assignment, this, it isn't as valuable to the social study site. People aren't going to be using it. Um, taking information from those sites to use for your class notes for use on an exam. Maybe, again, to study, okay, but you can't have additional notes that you're using in an open note test. You would need to submit your notes in advance and submit your note, the notes that you used after, whatever it might be. There are certainly ways to get around that too. Using GroupMe to form study groups, who's available on Thursdays at six, love it. Using GroupMe to say, here are some answers um, or the attendance code, problematic. These are concrete examples and this is the way that your students think. So you can see how there can be some conflation and there's not a bright line for them when they're used to going to social study sites and the internet for help. So setting these guidelines, and again, the best way to do this is using these do's and don'ts and having a discussion about it. Because getting that assistance can be hard to see. Course Hero had an advertisement that was like, scholars, let us know your best, you know, study guides, the teachers who gave, you know, the test in this. And it's like pumping them up. There's some messed up advertisements saying, help forward higher education by giving us, you know, your tests so that your fellow scholars can excel. I mean, it's, it would send chills down your spine. Um, and then new technologies, of course, provide even more opportunities for dishonesty and kind of entice students to some degree by acting like they're doing some sort of favor. They are crowdsourcing your information from students so that they can then sell their subscriptions. That's what it comes down to. So keep that in mind. And what are, as um, someone said earlier, what are the ethics of that? What are the ethics of, I mean, this New York Times suit with um, chat um, or open AI is gonna be fascinating. That's a whole other discussion. But also establishing clear expectations, setting your guidelines for assessment. So this is how to set clear expectations based on different, um, different things that you're using in your classroom um, for assessment, for papers, for online activity. So provide the information very, very, very clearly for what um, you want that kind of environment to be. So outline what your effective testing environment is. Say, I want you to go you know, to a room, put a note on the door that says, do not disturb. If your respondent's lockdown browser or you, know, you have, you're in some way capturing a video of them in the room and we see somebody come to the door, we can't hear what they're saying because it's muffled. Now you're like, this could have been, they could have texted someone and asked for an answer. Yeah, we don't know. Or somebody said, hey, do you want to get some Chick-fil-A? We will never know. So how can we help that? Being preemptive, saying, put something on that says, I'm in an online test. Do not disturb until 2 p.m. Letting people know, don't text me. The other thing we see students looking at their phone, they're like, well, my mom texted me. Maybe, I don't know. Tell them, do not send anything on the phone. Now the hope is the phone isn't there, but there's addiction research related to that. Provide details again on what to do if their technology fails so that they know and they don't do the wrong thing that then again, they just stepped in dog poo and weren't even meaning to, they just weren't thinking clearly. Detail which resources, if you're allowing resources, which we don't think is a bad thing, um, what's permitted, again, with specificity that's beyond what you think would be necessary. Okay, prevention strategies, yay! <laughs> So much fun. Develop academic curiosity. I don't think anybody in high school ever does this for students, especially if you are teaching some upper division. They already have an interest in what you're teaching, so this is a little bit easier there. 
Um, so we talked about this too. I love how there's so much overlap um, in the CTE last week about discussing academic integrity in your own discipline and why it's important and what would happen if there was a question of academic integrity for the people in your discipline. What are best case scenarios? What are worst case scenarios? What's in between? I have never had trouble with students being able to quickly get to answers that are real life examples. Now we're tying relevance to content and reflecting on why does it matter in this field? What, how have you consumed material from this field, from an accountant, from an engineer? Um, and what did you count on? And then the context matters, talking about the real life case studies, talking about things that occur in the news. Also developing academic curiosity and, and finding that relevance for students. So this was during the um, pandemic, which surprises me. I thought that these numbers would go down the 87% want to learn more about things that interest them. Kind of wholesome. I think Casey is rolling his eyes right now. But thank God. And <laughs> this is her freshman data. Bless it. Get a better job, of course. Again, I hope this will come to consumerism. Um, consumerism, economics, and higher education, or of cheating. Um, to gain a general education and appreciation of ideas, let's expand our mind. That's more of our um, historical view of higher education. But what we know is that employers want students who can use critical thinking almost as their number one. Um, and so maybe we say that every single time a student's like, oh, I'm really frustrated. That's okay. You're developing your critical thinking. That's what employers want. How can we work through this? and get training for a specific career, of course. Okay, also use different type, we have different types of learners, different types of assessments. So can they give, a, can they make a choice also? Do a presentation through Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Can they give an e-portfolio? Um, exams through Blackboard, we're gonna talk about some ways that you can reduce the likelihood of cheating through the format of your exam in an essay format to analyze the depth of understanding. Um, timing becomes extra important in many of these, both due to artificial intelligence and due to how quickly um, students can generate ideas from online tutors. Um, again, understand the honor code at USC. Even if they, we ask them to re-watch that um, before the midterm, if the midterm is worth 20%. Again, we don't like things that get close to 40% of a course grade, um, but something that has a higher level um, of percentage of their final grade. Um, for e-portfolios, so how do you make sure that you're using prevention strategies when they're generating these um, for the grading component? How should they cite content? We now have in the AI presentation, um, and we have a, a separate workshop for students who have um, artificial intelligence violations, you can cite AI. Um, so if you have specific questions about that, let us know. And we have a slides on this is how you cite AI. There was a, um, a researcher that I was watching. Um, no, I'm sorry, it was the Graduate Summit for those of you at the Graduate Summit. I guess he is a researcher still. And he said, we're gonna get to a point where you should probably cite that you didn't use AI. That may be five years down the road, that may be 10 years down the road, but it's gonna become such an important part of how students even generate their ideas or look at the opportunities or mind map where they're headed with an assignment. Run any material through Safe Assign. Tell students, I'm gonna run this through Safe Assign. Let them know. And then outline what's an approved source material. Wikipedia is not, that's a really basic example, but for example, for essay, using Safe Assign again as a draft, show them what the safe, their Safe Assign report looks like. Some students don't even know that Purdue Owl exists, so Purdue Owl can assure them that they're using the right MLA style or the right citation. If you're not citing properly, you are running afoul of the honor code. There are I use Purdue Owl. Um, there are websites that can secure students' um, citation page to make sure that it is proper. Require them to submit their work cited with highlighted text. Here's a citation. Here's where I use it. That is very, very, very easy. And the best part is, I don't care if you look at it. It's teaching them 
to make sure that they are organized when they are using their citations. The number of students that we have say, I forgot. I don't know if they did or not, but there's sloppy scholarship and there's intentional cheating. You are eliminating both by using this, um, this strategy. Give choice in topics and assign prompts that can't be plagiarized because they come from some experiential component. This is what I experienced when I. Giving choice in topics helps students follow their own um, curiosity more and is more motivating. If you want to learn about something, um, you don't have a reason, you have less of a reason to cheat. Um, there was a um, Center for Teaching Excellence person who was talking on um, the podcast, Dead Ideas in Teaching and Learning. And she was like, you know, when we put together like a presentation for a conference, we would never think to cheat on that. It's something that we want to present on. It's something that we're interested in. It's something we want to teach other people about. And that mentality makes a whole lot of sense. So you can do that in your classroom. And then always do scaffolding, building a series of due dates for different stages of the essay. Here's when your um, outline is due. Here's when your research is due. I like to flip flop it. Tell me what your topic is and tell me what your research is because sometimes the research is kind of crappy. And I'm like, you're not going to get very far with this research because it's telling me the stuff you already know. On online exams, here prevents the strategies for that. Proctor use services if previously established. Respond to lockdown browsers should be used every single time. And we're telling students this is why we're using Respond to lockdown browser. Um, consider dropping the lowest test grade or quiz. If somebody's at that 2 a.m. oh crap moment, they can't get it done. They can either stay up, and we talk about this in new one-on classes. They can turn in so-so work, which is what we hope they do. They can take the F. Okay, take the F. They are more likely to take that F if they know that that's going to be their dropped class. Or they can cheat. So now, there really isn't so much reason to cheat if they know that they can drop that. Taking a practice exam in Blackboard, again, it doesn't matter what your questions are. It's to get them in the practice of doing that. And then please always, always, always randomize exam questions. If I am more likely to cheat off my BFF and my BFF is no longer sitting next to me, um, then you've solved a potential problem. Also on online exams, set the time limit for completing the exam that is class time. So what we know, we have so many more um, honor code offenses from people who leave it open for 10 hours. Now, if you have a student with a disability and the SDRC has said they needed extra time, you can set that one student in Blackboard, but it is lazy. I'm going to call it out to say this student needs more time, so I'm going to give every single student four hours. If I see a question, nobody's using Respondus Lockdown Browser, or you can't see it, I'm using my phone, in Chegg, if I have a Chegg subscription, I can ask the question that is on your test to a Chegg tutor and have an answer in as quickly as 15 minutes. If I have four hours to take your 25 question test, I can 100% get my answers from somewhere else. I don't have 15 minutes for questions if I'm taking the online exam and it's an exam that takes an hour and 15 minutes to take. We do not, do not, do not have nearly the problem with outside source use in exams where it is the amount of the class time. Allowing for um, exams to be open book, open note, articulate if they can use the internet or not. I hope they can't use the internet. Um, but again, open note and open book, we know that students have to study their notes and be able to find what it is. Perhaps that's more questions than you would use because they can find it, but they have to be familiar with um, the data and they have to have been taking good notes all the way through. Um, do not allow students to review feedback until the exam is closed. Sometimes the students who take it first in a 10 hour open exam, you know, it's graded and we give it back. Now we've just given back all of the correct answers. Those correct answers can then be sent to the students who haven't taken it until 6 p.m. Please use a variety of assessments. Um, I actually changed this and after I sent this, um, don't use multiple choice, just don't. That is way too easy to just find an online answer. If we could just outlaw, not how it's not legal, so instructors, you don't really know what they know. It could be a guess. Short answer application questions, now they're synthesizing information. Essay questions, there's a bit of a synthesis. If you have also made them 
artificial intelligence proof. Protecting your exam content. Post only the answers and not the questions on Blackboard for homework and tests. Um, that takes a little more work for a student to go, okay, I'm going to have to combine this and the instructor over here just gave me the test. So if I have to, you know, in, insert five um, documents to get my subscription, I'm going to do what's easiest in the path of least resistance. Give students old tests to study from um, so that they don't search online for your new test. And you can tell them that. Here's the thing. I'm going to give you this test because we're not using the same questions. You're not going to find my questions online because I wouldn't do that. This is the test that I give students to study from because if you understand most of these components, they represent what I think is most important for you to be able to talk about on the next test. And we talked about um, in this the value of helping students understand what is on the final in a broad sense so that they are focusing their studies in the right places. And you've chosen what that right place is because that's what's most important to you as far as what they glean from the class. Google your course code. This is really, this is way too long. Um, this just kind of gives you an idea of how and why it occurs. Um, and I am sorry that this section is a bit of a mess. <laughs> I also corrected this last night, but I had too many, <laughs> too many posts. In this section, strategies to prevent academic misconduct. How do we reduce the likelihood? Post your course material and old tests on Blackboard so that you've got your own monitored social study site um, and let students know the reason I'm doing this is so that you have access to some of this, but you're not searching and finding other things that mm, mm, post only answers again and not questions to quiz exams and material. Then they can understand what is important to you. Again, recollect tests after you hand them back for class review. Um, but no, a screenshot is, is so quick. Um, again, if you are handing back a test, you've got to create a new test for the next semester. That's all there is to it. Include a statement about using sites effectively in your course syllabus. Here's why I think Quizlets can be helpful. Here's why um, I have changed a third percent of this course content. And so what you find on social study sites will not help you. Um, share that they can't post your quizzes or tests on these sites because that is your um, people get into academic property. I don't think you're going to want a lawsuit on that, but I, th I think it sounds like a cogent argument. I say that. Mm. But that's hard to see. We put a lot of work into that um, and telling them this is this is my work. OK, reporting. If you believe something has happened, what our honor code says is anybody who suspects that there has been a violation is supposed to make a report. Here's the beauty and here's how we want you to explain it to your class. I'm not out to get anybody. I am beholden to reporting something. I'm not the decision maker. Then I'm reporting it to an unbiased person, doesn't know me, doesn't know you, looks at the information, not subjectively. Again, because I feel a little hurt. My feelings are hurt if you're cheating in my class. So that's not the person I want to be fair to you. But just in case there's any chance I don't realize that I have a bias, we're giving it to someone else. I'm going to make that report. They're going to be in touch with you. You submit a report, OAI website. There's an online form. And it asks you for supporting documents. The supporting documents are critical. My master's is in um, education. And so if you are telling me about coding, I don't know what the heck is going on. The reason that this code does not comport with the assignment is because it has a dash. This would not work if they inputted this code, but that used to be code language from four years ago. So we think this person may have used a test or site that had an uploaded test from four years ago. Every These sites build every single year. So they have things that people have been uploading for years and years and years and years and years. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We reach out to the students so that you kind of know because it might feel awkward when that student's in your class and you're like, I don't know, what do I say to them? If you let them know in the beginning, this is what my concern is, so I have to report it. Is there anything you want to share with me about it? They're going to let me know when you get a letter. You're going to receive it to your university email account. That's not so confrontational. That's okay. 
Now you're passing it on to us. Let us take the buck. Then if we're not sure, we don't understand your report, we're gonna contact you back. Please contact us back as soon as possible because we've already reached out to the student. They're stressed. We wanna get this resolved. If their appointment is in four days and we contact you on day one and you don't contact us back till day three and a half, now we're sitting there at day three and a half going, do we need to put this off? How come this stuff? Please, as quickly as you can. Student meets their conduct administrator. We say what happened. They tell us what happened. Sometimes I have more questions after that to come back to you with. Then we will discuss the findings with a college liaison, or if it's a typical first defense college liaison, say, don't call us, we don't have time for that. And again, we're not kicking students out for the first offense. If it's a graduate student and they have had an egregious offense, we've had dissertation plagiarism, that can happen. But what they are likely going through is a wonderful course on academic integrity, on their own ethics, where they rewrite what could they have done differently. It uses a lot of um, counseling-based strategies. Students give us fantastic reviews on it. They can say yes or no, I agree with this. We'll let you know what the resolution is. If they wanna to go to a judicial counsel hearing, we'll ask you to be present and just talk about what gave you the suspicion and what your um, steps were, and then you can decide if they're found responsible if you want to levy a grade penalty also. Please do not levy it before because if they get a not responsible, then they're going to go, why do I have a grade penalty if this office found me not responsible? We are so close to the end. Application. How do you want to utilize what we did today within your course? What's your takeaway? What do you want to change? And thank you, Kirby, for the expectations. Um, the other beauty of setting expectations is it's your opportunity to share with students that you want them to succeed. I don't know why students wouldn't think that. Um, but when I started telling students that, I'm here as a resource. If you start not to succeed, I want to know if there's something that I can do to help you come to me. They really do still have a little bit sometimes of the sage on the stage mentality. And we are partners in learning because, again, as you've said, letting students know what you want them to get out of the class and using integrity components of that, talking to them about what they find interesting about the class. If they don't find it interesting, what might they, if they haven't seen something that sparks their curiosity in the syllabus, what about your particular topic about American history from this year to this year? Do they find curiosity? And perhaps they can take one assignment and you know you can let them follow that. Hey, Angie using um, stuff directly from our website. You don't have to invent it. And we also like when students, or um, I'm sorry, professors, take it from our website and then personalize it. And I think you teach real estate, talking about real estates and markets and why integrity you know, is important to that in your statement so that they see that relevance. Love it. Um, we think that students can see how things are tied together, um, but if we don't tell them, um, we're 50-50 especially if you have outlined expectations clearly in the beginning and said, when there is a violation, this is what's going to happen, or when there's a suspicion or an allegation of violation, this is what will happen. You have taken away the ability of students to feel like you're out to get me, um, especially when it's in print and has been verbalized. Thank you, Casey. What can I answer for folks? Stump the pianist. And Carrie, I hope um, you would put your seeking ways to navigate the conversation that might happen if there's a potential concern. One of the easiest ways to have the conversation, there's an investigator in our police department that always says, give them the out. So sometimes a way to broach the conversation can be, you know why most students cheat? You didn't intend to, you ran out of time, and you looked at your options, which were reach out to my professor, take the F, try to go like this, write something so that maybe you get a 50% or cheat. I want you to know that if you had come and spoken to me, we would have worked something out. There would have been a grade penalty of maybe 10 points for a day. You would have a chance at a 90, and I want you to not question that in the future. I'm um, telling students that at the beginning. If you ran out of time, we've all been there. I just gave that student the out. Now, if that's not the reason, they might go, no, it wasn't that. But I've normalized the fact that you're not a bad person. You did something that you've got to talk to the uh, Office of Academic Integrity about but let's talk about what got in the way. Did you do something those three days before that you didn't plan to do and that was your um, preparation time? These are normal mistakes that we all make. Um, and so I think normalizing that is a great way to navigate opening that conversation. And if a student gives you nothing, you haven't lost anything. 
and I hope Alex that answers your question too about shooting away so don't feel confrontational I'm so glad you asked that awesome thanks everybody thanks everybody Thank you.